<clears throat> what do you suppose? Do you think this is as difficult as it looks? In crafting these little presentations, finding um, the setting and the occasion, which I try to make, or I prefer, of course, a natural setting, one that's not too contrived, although there is some contrivance, there is some staging on my behalf. And I use a certain degree of props such as written material, diagrams, demonstrations. There are a few demonstrations that I could put together. Um, but to videograph all that, to record all that, um, requiring first the, the equipment and the, then the time, and even aside from that, getting the content is one thing. I can produce enough content a couple of videos here and there or recordings without video just audio simple audio memos as they are as they are but then finding the time and going through the sorting process and the decision process to um, edit and uh, determine whether or not it, um, I convey what I mean to convey sufficiently. And oftentimes I will um, do multiple goals for certain <clears throat> for certain of the same topics, I might go over them one or two times. Um, and then I would release like the third or fourth, I would, or I would prefer to release the third or fourth, if I can even get to that point. Lately, it's been, t it's been sliding by so fast, so rapidly that I may, I may actually write a script. I might actually get the video camera and the, the recording device, which is actually the same thing, go somewhere and do a little presentation and it might be, I might get a little bit of sunlight or it might be towards the end of the sunlight as this af as it sets or after it sets. <sighs> and then I'll get all the pieces together, but then assembling it into a slick little presentation. Well, that is something that just, well, something I don't I haven't gotten around to with my later projects, more recent projects. And by the time, like, um, if I say specifically dedicate a, a discourse to going over a, a talk, a, a, a current talk, let's say, one that comes out as it comes out, the day that the talk is delivered, and um, I may not get to the editing part and not be, or, or I may not do it sufficiently enough Maybe I'm do it too long, make it too long of a ramble, go into too long of a tangent. And anyway, as time goes by, it's like, it's almost as if we've, there is a moving on, there's a constant moving on to the next thing and the next thing. And um, <clears throat> it's not worth it to go over where whatever talks come up as they come up, if there is error, which is primarily, which is primarily what I feel apt to point out. And whether you like me or not, you have to admit, you, you don't have to admit anything, but the evidence stands that this is true, that I'm devoting attention to certain things and like anyone else, I'm not the only one. When error arises, I'm inclined to point it out, especially if I'm the only one to notice it. Take, for example, the recent talk um, of the Q&A. 
Now, there was one question that was highlighted by John Lamb Lash that was a rhetorical question. I accidentally called it a sarcastic question, but actually the more apt term would be rhetorical. It was a rhetorical question. And I brought it to the intention, it brought it to the intention of the poster and of um, Lash and Caridwen, and the issue was resolved. It was something that <clears throat> had no one pointed it out would have been answered and wasted time and, and rig pug going into this rhetorical question. And just to do as much as that, as little energy as it took me, uh, about half an hour of my day to do that and to deal with that there was also a, a particularly a particular emotional drainage, an emotional tax, which um, comes up when dealing with anybody, when dealing with any people. There is an emotional tax because I know that there are other living tads that you are out there on the other end of your receiving spectrum, whatever your receiving device, you're getting this little transmission and you're a living person and you've got feelings and you've got sensitivities and the textual, digi the digital textual medium is probably the worst way to attempt to reach someone, especially with sensitive matters in regards to that. So yes, it's emotionally draining. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying there's only so much that I can do. <laughs> and what I consider to be my messages have hardly begun, I've hardly begun to lay it out to its full extent. And then, and then the question is, who in the earth would have the time or interest to want to go through what could potentially amount to hours and hours and hours of my discoursing and my speculations and my um, theories, especially as it pertains to errors in the telestic intel, the modern day mystery intel. We're fleshing it out, you know. <clears throat> we can't, you cannot say you cannot, how can you, here's a better way to say it. How can you demonstrate the claim? I was going to say you cannot claim to be a disciplined telesti, but I will say instead, how can you verify this claim that you are a disciplined telestus? How can you verify that today? Aside from repeating factoids from the narrative and other factoids <clears throat> from Lash's discourse. What more can you do to, let's say, prove your prowess and your faculties as a noetic scientist, a telestic investigator? Well, we're giving it a shot, aren't we? We is such a terrible word. Well, here, let me say this. You are giving it a shot. I'm giving it a shot. I'm far from perfect. I'll tell you first and foremost that I am fallible, and I know not anyone who isn't. I know not a single infallible person, or a single infallible doctrine, or a single infallible science. Yes, science is, is voracious in many regards. Certain sciences, that is, not definitely not all of them. Not necessarily the ones that are popular either. Quantum mechanics, as you know. Anyway, 
However, every science is fallible. There is nothing that is infallible. There is nothing and no one that is infallible that is, say, immune from error or making a mistake. Even the Aeon Sophia makes mistakes, so get over it. There's nothing that's infallible, and I certainly am not. Anyway, you're giving it a shot. You're trying to demonstrate your prowess as a telestic investigator, all right? But so much as the claim that you are a modern-day Gnostic, well, compare yourself to the facility and also the community, so to speak, it's a good, it's a decent enough term. It's not the best term, but the community of Gnostics, of Telestai, that they had access to the libraries, the sanctuaries, the plant medicines, and also the guides, the Nahuals, the Hierophants, to be present and to share with the younger generation this experience, this powerful mystical experience, all right? I can't say that that exists today, and I don't know how anyone can claim that we have reached the point of truly reestablishing the mystery schools as they were, and it doesn't have to necessarily be as they were. It can be a whole lot better can be different. Things can work out differently today than they did in the past. <sighs> and we're working towards that. We again. Pardon me. You're working towards that. And so am I. And I make mistakes. And so do you. Now if you can point out my mistakes, I would appreciate that. Gratitude is quite a difficult thing for me to express. That doesn't mean that I don't feel it. I have... I have an unconventional sense of philosophy as re in regards to how you should live your life and what are what is necessarily... What is necessarily acceptable behavior for expression? What's necessarily acceptable for you to express and how to express yourself and how you feel? For example, under the conventional model, it is unacceptable for anyone, adult or child, to demonstrate a temper tantrum in front of anyone, and some would even hold that you shouldn't do it even privately, that you shouldn't have an emotional tantrum. I don't buy that. I don't stand by that. I don't dismiss someone because they have an emotional tantrum in public in front of me, although it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to say, oh, look at that. Look at that immature little boy, shouting, angry. Don't listen to him. I'm in no shouting mood right now. Oh, yet... I feel I will be... later on. And I take pleasure in the act of shouting. I feel more alive when I shout than when I speak timidly. And just because I whisper doesn't mean <sighs> I'm feeling timid. I 
I think that your emotional spectrum is perhaps a little narrow or skewed. In the conventional, in the conventional, uh, there we go, the conventional academia of public schooling, I was a well-behaved student, I was a well-behaved child, and I didn't cause fuss in class, but there were other children who did. There were other, other children who caused fusses in classes, and I always disregarded them. I slighted them as the teachers would. Oh, there's a delinquent. He's rebelling. And while I didn't agree with their particular cultural, um, <laughs> the particular culture of, let's say, gangster rap that a lot of my classmates was knee deep in. <laughs> I thought that was pretty disgusting, really. <laughs> At the same time, now that I know what I think I know, or I think I know what I know, about the whole nature of um, school systems and this, this, this worship, this regard, high regard for the scholar, the teacher, the professor, thou shall not raise thine voice against the professor. Thou shalt speak to the professor in a respectful tone. Not sarcastically, not critically, and not harshly. You shall respect thine professor. It's none of your business. you think that I'm coming from a place of disrespect, you're sourly misunderstood. You're sourly misunderstood in that regard. If you think that I come from a place of disrespect, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't waste my breath if I didn't have any respect for the man and what he's done and what he's trying to do, what he's attempting to do. And it has validity. It has tremendous validity. Why do you think I am here? Why do you suppose I'm here? If you think that I've come from a place of disrespect and you question the fact that I'm rude, oh yes, I'm the master of rudeness. But rudeness is something that is going to emerge. I'm not going to be the only one to see to that. <sighs> there are some of you out there who will catch on to this rudeness and figure out how to bring it out eloquently, elegantly, and with beauty. How to bring about, bring about this ruddy, earthy, Duende that sears in your blood. Some of you already know how. Well, it's something that you're able to do only once you're able to do it. And it comes, it wells up from the toes. Mine is to question every convention. I'm not always right. It's not that all conventions are wrong. Who's that, PB? Who's that?
Who's that little girl? Somebody barking over there. Good girl. Who's that? Did you scare them away? I don't have to apologize, especially not for if I've potentially hurt your feelings. Well, how can you hurt someone's feelings who's already hurt before you even said anything to them? Yes. Maybe like salt on the wound. Quite often, more often than not. The thing is, that wound existed prior to the salt. Those wounds exist prior to the salt. And I'm not here to... <laughs> I'm not here to speak down to you. I might be here to bug you a little bit. But therein, anyway, I have garnered more response with agitation than I have with more civil routes. Despite my condition here, living in um, crowded enough of a city, more crowded than my liking. She, her, her beauty is still coming through pretty, pretty decently. Look at that. There's this serene stillness in the air. Yes, there are occasional disturbances, frequent, frequent. Disturbances. Frequent disturbances. Huh? Uh, FYI. That would be this stick, one of these sticks fallen upon my canoe from this here ash. Hello, lady. Just look at that cloud. Uh, there. sure really what I'm trying to invoke at this point anyway I'm just really observing um, enjoying the view of the pink clouds despite this condition I wish I can leave when I want to if I want to I can get away from this condition with relative ease. And if it's a treacherous path, or not, I'll do what I can. 
and what I can will emerge as I try. Whatever all this means. It's like you're trying to get that autistic scowl. You're trying to understand what's it all about. And my tone may be flat, and my mood dry. That doesn't mean I'm in a bad mood. I have a difficulty relating to people or vice versa. Tads have a difficulty relating to me because they are trained to view their emotions in a rigid sense. Sadness means bad. Anger is bad. Happy, smile, polite. Please, thank you. Good. Oh no, someone being angry. That bad. That no good. That unacceptable. It's what this word people keep throwing around nowadays. Juvenile. To see someone in a quote, bad mood, and think that there's a problem. To perceive a problem that isn't there it is the dilemma of the autistic child. Really, what you have on your hand is a genius in a lot of cases. Even in non-autistic children, they are little geniuses. And they get punished for it. Children get punished for their genius and thought of as something wrong. Lash has said that he never got the look of which Alice Miller refers to from his parents. They gave him another entirely different look, a look of horror and disapproval. I think I, I've seen that look. I've seen that look on adults, and I've seen that look on some of you. What's wrong with you? Are you the spawn of Satan? Lord, what has happened to my child? You see those lines here? Yeah, that's the look. You can give me any look that you want, dear. Any look that you like, babe. <laughs> there is nothing so much wrong as I am attempting to make it work. Oh yes, back to that. There's a stark difference. There's a significant difference between today, your time, my time, our era, and yesteryear, time of the Telestai and the mysteries, the mysteries of old, of ancient Greece and the, and the Mediterranean world, the Ermian Plateau, and Syria, Assyria, Persia, the Persian mystics. Those days are far from us in both senses. They are far in the past and they are also far in the future, you see. And we're heading there, or okay. You're heading there. Perhaps along with me, perhaps not. I'm heading there. So I intend, and I may make errors along the way. And this is critical. Don't throw out the gesture, the jester that can mock anyone, including the king. I can mock any of you. I can imitate any of you. If we were at, if you and I had the opportunity, that is, to meet in the flesh, which I've done so a couple of times, I think, I think we're approaching the time. I think I'm approaching the time of more meetups, more meeting of you strangers, and you meeting of me, 
a stranger. You know, I say I reveal myself, but how much do I really reveal and how much can I actually reveal on this archontic medium? Very little. Is it enough? Not really. It's not really enough. But it's a start. So, as you and I go along, along our journey and our practice, honing our faculties, you know, you can't, can you actually say that your faculties are honed enough? That your discipline is sharp enough? Is it? Is your focus that sharp? Can it be sharper? That's the question. Not how sharp it already is, but how much sharper can it be? And how much more can we refine it? And as a task I'm taking upon myself <laughs> for work that no one's asking for, the criticism that no one's asking for, be aware, perhaps, that even if I'm wrong, I don't have to be 100% right in all the things I say. I, I'll be lucky to be 10% on point. You too. Come on. Just bring it on. Let me see. Let me see you discourse and present the truth in your own words. And um, see how accurate you can get. Let's go. That is a challenge. Also, if someone happens to bring awareness, and I invite this, I am starting to see this now. It take it, It's almost as if it takes a little bit of aggravation to get folks to say what they need to say, the unpleasant things that they need to say. And I welcome that. That's very welcome. Bring it on. And I'm not going to stop either. It actually gives me some vitality. You'd be surprised what bitterness and sourness actually does for your sanity. In any case, sour or delightful, I can give you many flavors and I'd like to see the variety of flavors you can deliver. Emotions are but handles. You have a spectrum of handles to crank. And really, that's all you do, even in your gratitude. And y'all are there saying, thank you, Lash. Thank you, thank you. This was so beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you're just cranking a handle. It's kind of a worn out handle. But how well does it work? What does it effectuate? Appreciation is another difficult thing. Aside from emotion, aside from the emotions of anger, anger in itself is complex and beautiful. <coughs> Who's up there? But so is appreciation. <sighs> you aren't accustomed to seeing this. Maybe you are. Maybe you have seen it once. But is it possible for someone who is the rudest to be also the most appreciative? What I'm talking about is transcending the norms of politeness, 
and politically correct manners, such as the Ten Commandments, thou shall honor thy father and mother, yada, yada, blah, 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 blah. To have a colder and more dispassionate approach This passion is the opposite of love, and it pairs with love as well. To be filled with love is also to experience tremendous dispassion. Say, for instance, when you're in love with someone, you don't care about anything else. Isn't that how it is when you're in love with something or when you're feeling that mood entirely you could care less about anything else that's dispassion dispassion is the protective aura and the invincible force surrounding love if you have no dispassion, you cannot protect your love. In fact, it makes it more prone for you to get distracted. In, in general, there's a lot of things that come to agitate you that you should just adopt. You ought to adopt a dispassionate attitude towards it. That's one of the things that I found with um, meditation, I'm not promoting meditation, but they do claim that there's an attitude of whatever, I can't think of the word, equanimity, that's the word in Vipassana, equanimity, well, equanimity, no, I don't think that it's about equanimity, I think it's about indifference, being able to be indifferent towards anything towards insult towards injury towards pain not abjectly indifferent like oh i don't care that's sorrow that's that's misery or whatever that's wallowing that's not dispassion Well, I think I've rather blathered, blathered on long enough for now.